this is a program where we are trying to identify the various ethnic groups in Zimbabwe, uh, looking at their, their past, how they came into Zimbabwe, certain of their chief uh, cultural traits, also looking at their spirituality. But before we begin to appreciate the various ethnic groups in Zimbabwe, such as the Ndebele, the Tonga, the Nambia, the Venda, the Virwa, the Shona, and many others, I think we need to go back many years, that's the back of beyond, and look at how uh, Southern Africa, especially, was inhabited. I think we recognize that uh, here we had what we term the Stone Age. And during Stone Age, the people that we see, and that is indisputable, uh, these are the Sun people, the people that we used to call the Bushmen. Now, these people uh, left evidence of their occupation of this part of the world. In South Africa, for example, within the Trankensberg Mountains, there is a place which is a World Heritage Site. site. I think it's one of the five or so, including Mapungupwe. And there you will see beautiful uh, sun uh, paintings, or rock art, as we sometimes call that, which is evidence of uh, the fact that they occupied that. But in addition to that, we also see uh, a lot of evidence, uh, some guides which we find there, uh, some uh, bone arrowheads, which is proof of occupation by the sun. Within the Matopos, we find a lot of these, uh, this rock art. And this is the reason why uh, Matopo Hills was declared a, 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 by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site on the basis of its cultural heritage and also its natural attributes. So the first people that we see in Southern Africa are the Sun, who were essentially a hunter-gatherer people, very different from those that were going to come later the hunter-gatherers uh, lived in some, we've got some caves within Matopo Hill, such as Nswatugi, such as uh, Bambata, such as Bomungwe. All these were habitats for these they used to roam around. They didn't have a sedentary life. Uh, they are uh, settlements were not permanent. They, they moved from place to place, a nomadic people chasing after these, uh, the, the animals, the various kind of animals. That's how they lived. And because of that sedentary life, they, they didn't have, they didn't have uh, permanent settlements. So these are the people that are the first comers, as it were, into this part of uh, Central and Southern Africa. So, Everywhere there is evidence. So that's the good thing that they did. Simple people, but left a record, nobody disputes. What could be disputable, perhaps, is the significance of or interpretation of their rock art. Some people will, 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 will give their own interpretation. Or one scholar says this means that the same uh, picture is interpreted differently by a different person. But at least the record is indisputable. They are the first people, and they are not a Bantu people. They are not an iron mining and an iron working people. These are the sun, bakwa, abatwa as they are called. When one goes deeper into the back of beyond, to me, um, the most important element is understanding that historically, what we are bringing out is just mere fact. What happened, what was. As one friend of mine usually puts it, that archaeology is an, is an exact science. Yet beyond all the things that we account, there is the need for us to get deeper into what I call the spirituality of these happenings. Why, for example, would the, the people during the Stone Age only paint certain types of animals? Um, when you look at the paintings in one of the rock arts that is around here, you, you would see the element of the undulating, really, as, as, the, as the artist would say, it is just the, the undulating slopes of the, of the Matopo Hills, for example. Whereas, for some of us, you would say it is a snake. Then why the snake? Why the buffalo? Why the giraffe? 
It then brings us to the point that says people are in themselves related to a certain spiritual reality which is higher than them. Something that archaeology cannot get, something that uh, history cannot just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, capture. Now, at that point, that's where we actually have to come to, a, to an understanding of the spirituality of the people that we're dealing with. This area of Southern Africa is part of Africa, and Africa is characterized by a certain religiosity, for lack of a better term, or properly put by a certain spirituality which is only typically African. When we talk about rock art, I think we need to appreciate that uh, these sand were recording animals that formed their diet. Some of them could have been totemic animals, but we think some of them. For example, within this Matopo area, we have numerous animals like uh, the Kutu, we have the Impala, uh, we have the giraffe. I'm mentioning those that we capture, the land that we are able to capture, various Taika, Steen Park, all these we are able to detect from their rock art, which becomes an important way of preserving history. And this is characteristic of all humankind. We record history, but where there might be a difference is that we record it differently. But what matters is that we record history. Within the Stone Age, the hunter-gatherers people would then paint within their caves and they would capture certain things that were within their social framework. And you find certain animals and other animals you don't find. I have not in all these paintings found the painting of a bird, for example. But there is a particularity about that. Why not a bird? Maybe you don't see the bird, but you see the representation of a bird. But you will find animals that are characterized by the violent animals, the soft animals, the level-headed animals like the snake and saddle, etc. All these animals present a certain element of who the people are. Rock art is a record of human experiences, specifically of the sun. But as we shall indicate later, they were found here by a new group of people. So their art incorporated incorporated those newcomers so you see you can see even from the height of uh, these human figures a taller people these were the bantu that we shall be dealing with later but let me say essentially we are here dealing with an african people whether we call them sun or what and thoughts they are their related group they are essentially an african people and it is therefore very critical that when we interpret their art, that we interpret it from an Afrocentric viewpoint. That is important. This is why sometimes you look at some of these interpretations, very strange and most of them associated with what they will call superstition. When foreigners do not understand the African way, particularly relating to spirituality, then it's superstition. That, that is uh, most unfortunate. However, these were a hunter-gatherer people. They were hunting the various animals that I've referred to. They were also collecting food items, berries, fruits, uh, some chupas. But we do not seem to see much of what they collected represented, more of what they hunted rather than what they collected, which would indicate to us that perhaps the emphasis was more on what they hunted than on what they collected. Or it becomes, or they faced particular or special challenges when it comes to uh, running after these animals. But 
Wait fruits, that's easy, there is no challenge. You easily collect that, you go and dig. The, the chupa is readily available. But animals also run for dear life. And so they present a challenge. That I think in your memory would stick longer than something that doesn't present you with a challenge. But as I have said, what is important is that these are African people and what, whatever, whichever way we try to interpret that, let us not forget that we are dealing with an African people who will differ markedly from those that arrive later. We are here talking about Stone Age, and, well, which we divide into two epochs, the early Stone Age and then the later Stone Age. We realized a little earlier that the people that lived during the Stone Age, as you might well realize, were people that were in very strong consonance with nature. Don't forget that I said in that triangle of God, man, and nature, the closest to the two is man and nature. It is clear also that one would would uh, see in the rock ant that you find around uh, the mad Topo Hills where we are, that the rock ant presents pe the, the, the human's discourse with nature. Why do I call it a discourse? Man seems to be in conversation with nature. He is talking with nature. What is he saying? He is saying, I have come from God, but God has put me to this place, not just to be there, but also to benefit from nature. One, two, also to fight nature and overcome nature. Three, but also to learn that this theophanic representation of God showing himself in nature and showing me his mind in nature, I can then behave well. So I will learn how to slaughter an animal by seeing how maybe an eagle catches an animal. How does a jackal catch the other, you know, animals like the kudu, etc., by chasing them? So what do I do? I follow that. So in nature, you then see the mind of God. Not just the mind of, of things. Uh, unlike the Eurocentric view, the Eurocentric view says animals are animals. There is nothing in them that man has. But man says, in animals, I see myself. Or rather, in myself, I see the relationship of an animal, God, and then me. So, the earth is a result, rather, is a result of God intercoursing with man. But he has to do so through nature.